observe, we learn this, we observe one minute silence, okay? which means be absolutely still and quiet. Close your eyes if you wish. Every class we relax and then we stop. Okay? Keep quiet. Okay. I want to start with the question which you asked the last class. What's the difference between strong and stiff? Very good question. Uh, I've drawn here two curves, typical curves, and I've just written P and delta. Now, you should ask what P, what delta, what's the structure? Well, this is a generic graph which holds good for beam, for frame. So you have a load P and you have a reflection delta in the direction of P. Uh, not necessarily at the same location as P. For example, in a building, it could be delta could be at the top. So typically, you could get a load deflection variable like this. I've drawn two lines, one is yellow, the other is orange. The question is very simple. <coughs> which one is stronger, which one is stiffer? Which one is stronger? How many is yellow? No, it's, it's yellow. I want it to be very clear. Yellow is stronger because it's strength refers to the ultimate load resisting capacity. It could be flexural strength, it could be shear strength, it could be any strength. Okay. So this yes. is certainly stronger in the sense it can resist a higher load before collapse. Whereas stiffness, stiffness relates to load load per unit. unit. Now, can you talk about no. stiffness for either of these two lines? No. You have to be careful. The word stiffness. That is only initial portion, and later on it collapses. So we have typically, we have service, we have If I take the yellow line, This is ultimate. Service is much lower because this is an extreme load. Right? It's an extreme load and the element or structure is going to collapse at that load. Whereas service loads are usually somewhere here. You should call it W. So service or sometimes we say work. You get it? Now usually, you do your structural analysis using, nowadays everybody uses software, finite element analysis. That analysis assumes linear elastic behavior, which is more or less justified up to service, maybe a little beyond service. Uh, in concrete, you will get non-linearity even before that. We'll discuss that later. So, if this is your service load, you your stiffness is usually a reference made. You can talk of stiffness at any load level, but once you have a non-linear behavior, then you really can't talk of stiffness. Then you have to define at what load level or what deflection, what strain level your stiffness is. Okay, so then you have concept of tangent stiffness, secret stiffness. This would be called your initial tangent stiffness. But this is more or less straight. So this slope of P versus delta, it's like an elastic spring. This is your stiffness, right? This is K is stiffness is so obviously the slope of the orange line is more than 
the slope of the yellow line. So the closure is this structure or material is stronger, but this is I hope that fully answers your question. And often we get confused because we mix up these two terms. I've worked with doctors working on the wrist fixator and I found this problem with them. They could not really discriminate between angle of twist and torsion. So for the lay person, these terms are interchangeable. In common parlance, we say the stresses and strains of daily life. But there's a huge difference between a stress and a strain. And uh, I expect structural engineers to be sensitive to these differences. Right. Take an actual member. So, I could draw this graph for an element and say an actual element. Either compression or tension. Let's make it tension so the possibility of buckling is not there. Let this be P. Let its original length be L. And let the increase in length because it's going to increase in length. Let it be L plus delta. So this delta is the actual deformation in the memory. Let's say you have this kind of behavior. Let's not decide what is the material. <laughs> can you give a can you give an expression for stiffness? Yeah. yeah. Anybody? Anybody? Sorry. Sorry? A upon A upon M. Just as an example, this K is P by delta. I prefer to write this by by right? How did you get it? Okay, so you are right. Your answer is right. And this is also, he, he is thinking of a, a factor of half. Where does the factor half come? It comes in energy, in strain energy. It doesn't come. Can, can you go back to fundamentals and tell me how you got this? A by Strain compared to the tension. Now you're getting into trouble. From the expression of delta, that is PL for the A. I know everybody knows this formula in a truss element, that's the formula. How did you get it? Very related parts. I want you to be very strong in your fundamentals. Your answer is correct. I'm going a little deeper. It said use. Gave the answer from memory. As a good structural engineer, you should be able to derive from first principles. So, what is it that you will, what is that law which you will never forget, which you studied in school about elastic behavior? What's the, what's the type of law? What's the name of the law? Hooke's law. So, we are now talking about linear elastic. Hooke's law. What is Hooke's law? What is Hooke's law? Right? Hooke's law has two parts to it. What can someone tell me the two parts? I hope you don't mind these digressions because these are fundamental. Hooke stated that in the elastic limit, the stress is proportional to the strain. Wonderful. So he said, for an elastic material, what is an elastic material? Man? Which has nonlinear behavior. No. What is elasticity? Ah, it, that's plasticity. No. Ah. Plasticity is another term. Then you've got okay. yielding. What is elasticity? So we are now going back to basics. What is elasticity? Is able to regain its shape. Right. The ability to regain your original, the original shape after. The removal of the load. That is the elastic wave. So, which is more elastic, rubber or steel? That's a tough one. Which is more elastic, rubber?
rubber or steel? The lay person will say, rubber, rubber band. But structural engineers say, no, steel is got a higher modulus of velocity than rubber. What do we mean by that? So, then you have to have clarity. In both cases, it regains its original shape. Okay. But the force required to stretch steel for the same elongation is much, much more. So, elasticity doesn't mean easy, doesn't mean rubber band behavior. In the sense, it's easy to stretch. It only says, when you release the load, it will go back to its original shape. Got it? That's the first part. Then it also says that the stress strain behavior is linear. That means if a certain actual strain, epsilon, results in an elastic stress sigma, and if you apply two times epsilon, you will get two times sigma. That is the principle of linearity, which necessarily requires you to note that that straight line must pass through the origin. Then only the principle of superposition is valid. And strictly speaking, it can go in the negative direction also. So minus 2 sigma will also cause minus 2 epsilon. But some materials don't have the same modulus of velocity in both tension and compression. Clear? Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is true up to the elastic limit, as you rightly said. So, the second part, so one part talks of linearity, the other talks of regaining the original shape. And uh, strictly speaking, when you draw the stress strain behavior, if it's linear elastic, when you unload, it will go back to the original point. So, whatever strain in our energy is, is, uh, is accumulated, gets released fully. So, the ability to retrace and recover is the property of a, of a, of an elastic material. That's why we say the system is conservative. conservative. Now he brought in a factor of half that is valid for the energy component. What is this energy called? It's called strain energy. And this is half. Half. Sigma square three. Are you saying one? Sigma epsilon. Nothing wrong. Now here the question: which is the cause and which is the effect? So if you have a strain induced loading. Strain is a cause and stress or force becomes effect. But when Hooke did his experiment, probably he, you know, he had a spring and then he put some weights incrementally. So that was a load induced, load controlled experiment. So traditionally, our rule is the independent variable you put on the x axis and the Dependent variable on the y axis, but by convention, the physicists have decided that it is not force which is a fundamental dimension. MLT, it's mass, length, and time. The force is derived from these fundamental units, so force becomes always a derived unit. So we traditionally draw displacement strains on the x axis and stresses, forces on the y-axis. This quantity also has some meaning. We call it U-star. What is that? It's complementary statement. Okay, this is all incidental. Sir, and if you wrong, please correct it. Sir, you take the half, uh, upper half of the specimen, whatever you have indicated. Yeah. So, the center portion is not moving. Yeah. So upper half means one one D is not moving, another one the mode way delta by two. Yep. Now if you calculate stiffness, you will get D by delta by two. Right. So no, I am not I talking about we'll yeah, we'll go to first principle. <laughs> good one, good one. Well tried. Let's go back to first principle. Right? 
So we said E is equal to sigma by epsilon. If you have a pure actual stress, this sigma is P by A. This epsilon is, is, is delta by L. That's how you get this. I'll ask you a question. Don't get confused between displacement and strain. Is the force the same everywhere? If you got a free body? Yes. Is the stress the same everywhere? Yes or no? Yes. So it follows that the strain is constant from here to here. Now the displacements depend on boundary conditions. If I were to hold this and pull it, then the strain is constant, but the displacement will take this shape. This is called U. Like this becomes your delta. So, strain in this case will be P delta x or whatever you want to call it. So, don't get confused. If I hold it in the middle, then the displacement there is arrested. So, the strain. So these are all important points. So the displacement depends on boundary conditions, but the strain does. Clear? Yeah, it's all incidental. I find we let's come back to reinforcement. So yeah, good. But we're drawing just an angle. The angle is made by the graph of x axis. Can we find it? We're taking the angle that equal to the displacement. You said something. I'm glad you raised this question because there are blunders made even in codes. Don't ever talk of angle. Why? Because you need something. Wait, wait, wait. Very important. I do an experiment. This is an experiment, right? So this is my scale and say one, two, three, four. Whatever you And I get a line like this. This is my. If I take the slope of this line, that is my. In this case, point is this. I have a friend who doesn't like to do it this way. He says, "Why should I do? Let me do this. Is one. This is two, and this is three. He likes to stretch things a little bit. So the same line will now look like this. And you can try to measure this angle. It will be different from this angle. Your tap filter will give you different results. These are common blunders made by students. But you can't go wrong if you take a difference in height here difference in width there and take that ratio. You can't go wrong. Is it clear? So, that depends on your units. But if I put 2 into 10 raised to 5, it's not much. So, you have to use your brains. You, when you write something in millimeters, it looks big. If you want to write it in microns, it looks even much bigger, so you want to blow it up, it will look that. If you want to write it in meters, it will shrink. If you want to write it in kilometers, it will just disappear. So that's why you talk of significant figures. And you don't worry about whether it's 10 raised to plus 6 or 10 raised to minus 6, it doesn't make a difference. So I, I, your questions are good, but they reveal a lot of confusion. And it's fundamental. So all students tend to have. You need to sort out. You need to sift the shaft from the grain. That which is more, that which is that which is in essence, and that which is not so essential. But I'm happy you're asking the question. Any other question? Have we start? Told me that independent quantity should be on the x-axis. No. 
Does it mean that the next bill should be as rain hammer or what? Good, Good question. question. So I'll tell you the story. When Newton discovered his laws of motion, he was very careful. He said, force is proportional to 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 what? MA, mass into acceleration. Right? He didn't say it's equal to mass into acceleration. Right? So there's a constant of proportionality. Now, to give credit to Newton, we set the unit 1 Newton force and we said we make the constant proportionality 1 when we talk 1 kilogram mass accelerating to 1 meter per second square. But otherwise there is a constant proportionality. Now historically there has been a, a difference of opinion between engineers and physicists. For engineers, kilogram was always a unit of weight. For physicists, kilogram is a unit of mass. And so discriminate, we used to talk of KTM, kilogram mass and kilogram force. Do you remember? And one kilogram force is one kilogram mass into G. So that G was hidden there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Then later they came to a compromise and said, okay, you physicists, you guys win. Okay, we'll also stick to uh, mass as kilogram. But old habits die hard. In this. What should be the aim of education? This is a couple of things. What's the aim of education? I could take the approach that our job here is to learn reinforced concrete design and that's it. But half of you will never use reinforced concrete design later in you will be applying for whichever job gives you money and security. Join the railways. And you will be counting the goods wagons traveling on the, on the rails. So, I really want to add value to your life. Right? So, the whole idea of learning is to improve your ability to learn. So, tomorrow, whatever... The future holds for you. You can still approach it with a good analytical mind, a good intuitive mind, a good aesthetic mind, which can go deep and, and wide into any situation. Is it clear? So this is just a learning access. So our aim is to self-actualize, to really do very well in whatever we put in. So this is just a tool to sharpen our brains and minds and hearts. Is it clear? So you're free to ask any question. But we'll always come back to reinforced concrete design. But let's you're welcome to that. Okay. So <coughs> this is our first one. Today we will quickly cover our introduction to plain reinforced concrete concrete. Then we look at the other topics. Concrete is the most commonly used construction material consumed at a rate of approximately one ton for every living human being. That's, that's massive. And concrete is massive. Man consumes no material except water in such tremendous quantities. This is a harsh reality. That's why concrete is so important. In India, most structures are built with concrete, but not necessarily in all other countries. In the US, they use a lot of steel. Steel is not very popular in India, though they are trying hard to popularize it. Why? Simple question. After studying this course, if someone asks you this question, you should be able to answer. General knowledge. Why is concrete so popular? And steel relatively not so popular. Uh, yeah. it, yeah, raise your hands. That's the right way to answer. Yes. It's more expensive. More expensive. Steel is more expensive. Yeah. Okay. It's cheaper in the US? No, maybe mm. the US is really actually. No, no, like you're missing something. You're missing something. You're right. Finally, everything boils down to money. Right? Everything boils down to money. So whichever is cheaper has a greater chance of being more popular. Why is it cheaper in India? And why is it more expensive in India?
Labor is very expensive. Labor is very expensive. So, in any construction cost, you have material cost. You thought concrete and steel is only material. Then you have labor cost. India is a very populous country with a lot of poor people. The easiest job you can get. And by the way, if you happen to do badly in your subjects, one job you can always get is construction industry. Unskilled, skilled, different levels, right? People work. People work. And labor, it's good to have labor intensive work to give occupation to people. Right? So labor is much relatively cheaper in countries like India. And that's why concrete is so. <clears throat> and of course, with mechanization, we're reducing the labor, but you'll still find in India more people hanging around for over every job where less people could do it. Whereas in even in Europe, you have very few people working, right? Okay, so that's clear. That's why. Uh, uh, what is concrete? What is concrete? After finishing this course, you should answer at least this question. Huh? Again, let's go back to generics. Oh, generics, generics, generics. Generic. Gener if you look up the dictionary, what does the word concrete mean? Will it say a mixture of cement, stand, steel, whatever you've been taught? What else? Cement, aggregate, water. But even that's not today the definition of concrete. But leave that. What's a more generic definition of concrete? Have you got any concrete answer to give? That's a valid question to ask in any subject. But there you don't bring in cement, concrete, uh, cement, <laughs> sand and aggregate and all that. But I thought concrete is cement, sand and okay, what is this concrete? Right? Solid. And really it's a miracle how by mixing, you said mixture, no? You mix sand. Let's say you mix sand, coarse aggregate, and water. What will you get? You get concrete. When the water dries up, you'll get back the same mixture, right? It's not solid. It's actually it's a miracle that all these highly separate pieces of, of solid matter, of earth. When we talk of Panchabhuta, this is really earth, one element. That that one element, all these discrete things can become one solid element. We hope, we wish that you know, the country, the world is like that. Different nations, different religions, different people can also be a bit like concrete, which they don't. They can become one. They're all separate, all fighting. If the elements in concrete become like human beings, then things you, you can't build any buildings or nations. So, concrete means something solid. It also means something that is, that is, array, a simple layman's language. Not only you say, God, oh, this is a concrete suggestion, concrete idea. What's good about something solid? Change it. Huh? Change. Doesn't change the form so quick. Everything will change. That's a law of nature. Who said it? Well, two great people. In the West, a Greek philosopher called Heraclitus said, when you step your foot in the river, the next time you do it, it's not the same river, it's not the same foot, it's not the same person stepping. Everything changes. Everything changes. And the other great person who kept harping on it is Gautam Buddha. Nothing is solid. Everything changes. Everything changes. Change is the law. Change is the law. You know, it's a... So, but we are saying, 
relatively slowly. That's all we are saying. So slowly that you know, it lasts for some time. Right? So what's that property lasting in time called? It's a beautiful property. Yeah. Durability. So concrete is solid. It is durable. It can be cast into any shape easily. Right? But durability also in concrete, we also know how durable. How durable is a concrete building? How many years? Huh? Hundred years. If you're lucky. Hundred years. If you put steel in it, you'll be unlucky because steel is the weak point. It's a concrete corrosion. Okay, good. So, concrete is something solid, something durable, it can be cast easily, and uh, you can put it into any shape. Look at this. It basically is any solid material that you can make using a cementing medium. Today you can even avoid cement. Portland cement and still make concrete. You need this aggregate and you need a binding agent. Tomorrow you can come up with your own binding agent. Okay. And uh, things are changing. Sand is not available. River sand is not available. So you have to manufacture something that looks like sand. But usually you take stone and you break it into pieces. So basically you've got stone and you've got a cementing agent. Okay. Now can you give me some applications of concrete? Today, when you reach this class, you made use of many applications of concrete that come from your hostel room here. Name them. Okay, I'm not I'm not sure if you walked on a concrete Hostel pavement. Itself. You're imagining things, but anyway, hopefully there are concrete pavements in IIT, maybe near the hospital. I hope you didn't have to go to the hospital there. You have a concrete road there. Okay, you walked on that. Pavement, it's the first thing that comes to your mind. My God. Where do you live, by the way? Outer space somewhere? Where? Bird's nest? Hostel. Hostel is a how many story building? Three. Three story building. Where is concrete? Did you did you walk on concrete? Did you? The slab. Are Where do you sleep at night? On a bed. The bed sits on a concrete slab? Is it a solid slab? Is it durable? Yes, that's why you can sleep peacefully at night. Is the slab above you sagging? How to fall down? No, it's solid. So you're lucky. So your whole building, at least the slabs, maybe the walls are basically, the columns, the beams. So where you live is a concrete structure. Got it? Okay, what else? What do you do when you wake up first thing in the morning? Hopefully you, you've had a bath, I hope. Okay, so how did that water come? Pipes. Pipes. Sometimes. Pipes. Sometimes. Huh? Where was the water stored? Water tank. Water tank. How did it reach that water tank? So you find that concrete is used in storing and supplying. Hmm? So pipes are small, they are not concrete, but you have large hume pipes also. Which, so yes. concrete is in storing water. That's because it's durable. Otherwise, the concrete, you'll be having your bath in concrete if the cement and all slips out. Right? So, okay. What else? Did you switch off the lights when you came? Switch on? How did you get the electricity? You never think of these things. No gratitude. Where? Where did it come from? Hydropower, you're saying. All power plants use massively concrete. So in short, everything is gone. Though we, we take it for granted. Okay. Buildings, stadia, auditoria, pavements, bridges, breakwaters, jetties, dams, waterways, pipes, water tanks, swimming pools, cooling towers, bunkers and silos, chimneys, towers, tunnels, nuclear reactors, etc. etc. You can fill in the so concrete is really material we need to understand. To use wisely, to use economically, 
So there's always a trade-off between safety and economy. You must know how to interpret the videos. Concrete may be defined as any solid mass made by the use of a cementing medium. Look at this definition. It's a beautiful definition. But all of you have been brainwashed into saying, no, it's a mixture of sand and aggregate and water. And no, huh? this is the actual The ingredient surprise. Sand, gravel, cement, tradition. Its success in popularity may be largely attributed to durability under hostile environments, ease with which it can be classed with a variety of shapes and sizes, and its relative economy and stability. Simple. The main strength of concrete lies in its compression bearing ability. Very Commonly, natural materials are good in compression, but they are weak in tension. Bricks, stone, earth, mud, compression. But tension, all of them are weak. Which are the natural materials which are strong in tension? Wood. Wood, wood is good in both compression and tension. Then, steel. You get steel, when you dig the ground, you get steel. Well, steel has to be manufactured and there's a lot of energy that goes into extracting the iron ore and processing it. And but still, right. Other things you can pick up from the ground and do it. Okay, steel. Early days, what did they use? Huh? Okay, fiber. Natural fiber. Coil, root. Ropeways are made of that. Um, so, which the, the compression bearing strength surpasses that of traditional material like brick and stone masonry. So, what is the compressive strength of concrete? What is the compressive strength of stone? For example, if you don't swallow what is written in the book, you have to have some feel. What's the compressive strength of concrete? Huh? Give me some number. Give me a range. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Huh? What? Megapascal. Huh? You are saying Newton per millimeter squared and you are saying megapascal. Are they two different things or the same thing? Sure. Yes. So you see, you are pointing at the same thing using different words. Okay, megapascal is now the better thing to write. What is one pascal? Who was pascal by? Blaise Pascal. Ah. What is Pascal's law? It's important to know that. I'm sorry, it's a digression, but I want to tell you something which uh, actually caused distress in a water tank, which was big. Well, engineers should know that. So there was a water tank which had a shape like this. And the water level was here. So water finds its own level, you have atmospheric pressure here. And uh, this was done by a structural engineer. It's a big company, I won't tell the whole story to avoid embarrassing the people who did it. But the person who designed this, designed, I first saw it in the foundation, that say this was 8 meters. So, what's the water pressure here? Can you tell me? Inside? It's good. How much of water pressure? How much of water pressure? What's this pressure at the base? In a main project of 85 See, you're in MES. These guys are old timers. Uh, 50 years ago, whatever their bosses said, they still talk of KG. Are we are now in Pascals. So, talk about unit of pressure is Pascals or Mega Pascals, right? Tell me how much is it? Or kilo Newton. Tell me. How do you find pressure? Hmm? 
Combination works well for many reasons. What are the reasons? What are the reasons that this works? Similarly, if you've broken your leg, they do implants. They use titanium. They even use special grade stainless steel. Why does it work? Not all materials can be combined. It works because they have the same coefficient of thermal expansion. They have the same coefficient of more or less. Not exactly coefficient of thermal expansion. Very important property. What else? They bond to each other very well. Bond is absolutely important. These two, steel and concrete. 
Steel contributes not only to tensile strength, it gives property, another property to concrete which is badly missing in concrete. What is that? It's, you can see it in this graph. That property. The ductility. Concrete is a brittle material. It will break. Steel is a ductile material. It can stretch. So the combination brings ductility. Why is ductility important in buildings? Yes. It gives warning. Warning for what? Some it rings a bell. Yes, we get this No, you are talking about under reinforced behavior. No? Ductility is very, you know, under some kind of loading that's really helpful. What kind of loading? Earthquakes. How does it help? Steel might be like slows the damage. Slows the damage. Slows the damage. Huh? Steel might be like steel. Give me a correct answer. How does ductility help in earthquake resistance design? Some energy will dissipate. Very good. See, the earthquake is pumping in energy into the structure. The structure, if we were to behave elastically, will store that energy and release it. But the auto energy does so is so huge it can't do it. Right? So it it'll break. There must be some way to get rid of that energy. That energy is got rid of through many ways. Extensive cracking will release energy. Damping will release energy. But more important. Yielding of steel. So steel is yielding, and steel has this fantastic ductility property where you know it can go on yielding for a long, long, long time without without letting go of its strength. That's called plastic behavior. And heat is generated in that. So you know that's how the energy is dissipated. It's absolutely messy. So ductility is the way. And here you get cracks. Uh, this room has got a false ceiling, but if you were to see the beams there, those cracks are not visible. Otherwise, occupants in houses will complain. But cracking is unavoidable. Concrete will crack. So the crack should not be perceptible. So what's the crack width that is allowed in ports that you don't, you don't see it? Hmm? Point three mm, very good. Point three. So if you had to say point three, okay, and you didn't, so your point not not three, you have to then put your ten raised to plus two, then you'll be happy. So we we'll give you that correction. You just have to add some. So you can always make up by adding this ten raised to plus or minus and make up. Okay. Uh, the steel bars are embedded and it remains nearly horizontal. The reflexes are also not visible. The beam supports load with acceptably low deformations and effects. Then we'll introduce priestess concrete. Now, priestess concrete has a history which is as old as Rainfield's concrete. In priestess concrete, we apply some pre compression into the concrete so that. So that so that you don't, you delay the tension, you know, the tension doesn't develop and the beam supports load with very small deformation. We'll study this in detail later. So, this is how we have a Concrete is actually not a homogeneous material, you know that. If you look at the microstructure, it's not, it's a mixture as you rightly said, but it's still solid and uh, if it has to have the same properties, if you want to model it as a homogeneous material, then it should these this different particles should be more or less uniformly distributed across its medium. And that you can study from microstructure. So you have coarse aggregate of gravel, fine aggregate of sand, and you have binder, which is hydrated cement. So this is concrete technology, it's a big uh, course by itself. It's uh, something that you should know. I'm not going to cover it much, except to tell you that both good concrete and bad concrete can be made exactly from the same ingredients. 
So it's not just the materials, it's the know-how, how to make it. For example, how many of you can cook? So you, if you want to bake a cake, some people, and you get the same ingredients, some will give the cake that you love to eat again and again, and some you wouldn't go and hear. Why? Ingredients are the same. Same, same is with coffee. You can have bad coffee, you can have good coffee. If you had to select a single measure for concrete quality, which property would you use? Strength. Grade of concrete. Grade of concrete. Let's say you are an ethnic student from IIT Madras in tech instruction. And I have to ask you only one question to assess. One area to assess. Are you studying steel, you are studying concrete, you are studying Analysis, you're studying structural mechanics, dynamics, mm -hmm. theory of plates and shells. But I want to quickly gauge you, so I will ask you some questions in some area, right? Likewise, concrete has many properties, many desirable properties. But you want to make a quick assessment of the overall quality of concrete, and they must be more or less correlated to this fundamental concrete. Uh, property, right? Which property? Another thing, if you want to quickly test, you must be able to test it easily also. So, what's the one measure of quality of concrete? Compressive strength, and that's its, its greatest strength. So, yes, the desired properties of concrete are its compressive strength, tensile strength, shear strength, bond strength, density, impermeability, durability, etc. But among these, the property that easily tested and is perhaps the most valuable from the point of structural design is compressive strength. This is measured by standard tests of concrete cubes or cylinder specimens, right? In India we test cubes. Which is a better test, cube or cylinder? Huh? Cube is better because India is the greatest. <laughs> Why is cube better? It looks better, symmetric from all sides. The coordinate system, I think. And if you want to measure comp compressive strength, actually the cylinder gives you a more accurate assessment of compressive strength than the cube. Do you know that? Why? We'll see this in another module, okay, to the next module, but that's it's important to know. Will you get the same strength when you do the cube and cylinder? What's the size of the cube? Huh? 15 centimeters. See, you must be consistent in your units. We are using SI units. You stay with millimeters. Didn't say anything wrong. 15 centimeters. It's 115 millimeters. 150 millimeters. 150. And cylinder? Huh? 150 millimeter diameter and height? Many of the other important properties of concrete can be inferred from the compressive strength using correlations that have been experimentally established. For example, modulus of elasticity is related. What's the relationship? 5000 root FCK. Okay. Does the 5000 have units? No. And I told you Newton's law itself, there was a unit uh, proportionality of. What is the unit of modulus of velocity? Newton per millimeter square. What is the unit of FCK? Newton per millimeter square. Huh? But we put one square root there, no? So then what happens? So 5000 must also have units of? Square root of Newton per millimeter square. You should know all this dimensional homogeneity. And it's 5000 only in this version of the code. Earlier was 5700. So they keep revising because test data show better correlation. Okay. Concrete strength is notorious for its variability. It's a strong set. Notorious for its variability means what? Unreliable. Why unreliable? Huh? 
I give the same ingredients. You make concrete, same concrete, you get one stick. You make, you get another stick. You make, you get another stick. You make, you get another stick. You make, with, he's the best concrete maker amongst us. He alone makes. But from all that he's made, if you take some in it, you don't get consistency. This cube gives one string, the next cube gives another string, next cube gives another string. So that's not good. Right? That's not good. That's what we talk about. That's how we use the word variable. How many minimum specimens do you have to test for? We'll come to that. How many, how many minimum? So he's asking a question. Let's say, you're a mechanical engineer. Let's say, forget concrete. They are saying three. Round number, that's why. <laughs> what should it depend on? What should it depend on? Whether to take three or ten or hundred, what should it depend on? Huh? Cost. Yeah, that's true. In practice, that's what it is. Out of hundred specimens, any three specimens, if we take, there must be more than 15%. The difference between the compressive strength. Uh, wait, okay, so let's say you want to buy shirts, nice shirts like you know, multicolored shirts, <laughs> but you want it to be stitched well, right? You're a mechanical engineer, you're very sensitive, you'll always pull and see when the buttons come off or not, right? So you want to buy one million shirts, one million shirts, that's the order you're giving. How many shirts will you test? Three shirts? How do you tell? Use your judgment and tell. Some random sampling you do. How many you will test? Minimum 25. Minimum 25. <laughs> How many will you test? One million. By the way, in case you didn't know the digits, 10 raised to 6. <laughs> How many will you test? 10 raised to 6. How many will you test? Seven. Huh? Seven. Seven? Yes. <laughs> so it depends on the it depends on many things. One is let's say the manufacturer is a totally reliable manufacturer, then you can reduce the number of samples. Right? But even if it's a very good manufacturer, if you are supplying so many shirts, well, you will get complaints if they don't work. You will. You should have some correlation between the population and the sample. So, if you want to really answer the question, please study statistical quality control. It's a huge topic by its. You cannot just say, I'll test 3, I'll test 7, I'll test 25. It depends on many factors. Okay, And the code gives some some uh, numbers. But still, you have to use your judgment. It all depends on the large volume, on the size of the volume, and the importance of the structure that you're going to use. So, it's not an easy answer. Three is absolute minimum for convenience. But sometimes you have to test 30, sometimes you have to test 100. It depends on, on the specific application. Yeah. Any other questions? But these are good questions to as a designer, how would you specify concrete grain? You say M, what M? Add the number, M. No, no, M1, M30 M30. M30 concrete, what the hell does it mean? 30 is the characteristic strength of concrete. 30 is the characteristic strength of concrete. What is concrete. that characteristic strength? Uh, that means you are going to memory. Less than 5%. Oh, all that. What is M30? Compressive strength of concrete. That means if I test all the cubes, I'll get 30. Oh, I get. So, how do I decide? How do I decide? What is M30 concrete? Characteristic FCK. How come they use K for characteristic? Because the people who did it were Germans. That's why it's true. 
MCK uh, characteristic strength of concrete, right? What is characteristic strength? It's just a word. What does it mean? What is characteristic strength? Ninety five percent of the Will satisfy the strength required. I am asking you a simple question. What is M30 concrete? Answer in a sentence. The sentence is a sequence of words that make sense. What is M30 concrete? Now everybody is careful. <laughs> it's good. But still try. M mix design. M stands for mix. Mix design. Very good. Okay, so we we'll come to the answer. Here I ask this question very much. So let's look at some fundamentals. Quality control makes a big difference. So whenever you have dispersion in statistics, we use two terms. Dispersion and central tendency. There are measures of central tendency, there are measures of dispersion. Give me three measures of central tendency. Let's see. You can remember your sentence. Mean, median, quad. I won't trouble you by asking you what they are. What about dispersion, variable? Standard deviation, variance, and they are the same thing, yeah, standard deviation, where one is the square root of the other, yeah. Range, coefficient of variation, what is that? Good one, yes, you're right, we'll trouble you with that question later. Okay, now, let's say there are three manufacturers of concrete, and both all have the same mean strength. You will find that you have to be careful when you buy concrete from this guy. <laughs> because you don't know what you will get. You could get higher strength than all these guys, but you never asked for it. And if you were to test your three cubes and got these strength, you will jump up and down in excitement. But the next three cubes could be giving you these values. Totally unpredictable. Like the answer some of our students give. Right? That's not good concrete. So, with this red guy, you should test more samples. Now you get it. So, don't have some rule, three samples for all. No, 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 no. And if he's clever, he'll give you, he knows which three to give you. <laughs> okay, whereas the yellow guy is better. You, know, you won't get anything lower than this. You won't get anything higher. Why should you give higher strength than what is asked for? You are ordering the concrete. If you want only so much, I will give you only that much, maybe a little more. The green guy is the best of the lot. In the sense, he has a minimum, he has a least dispersion. Got it? So, you now understand the influence of quality. Now, as an engineer, you are a designer. You are trying to design a structure and people are going to build it. But after they build it, you must get what you ask for. So you want some minimum guaranteed strength. You don't care who the contractor is. You don't even know who the contractor is. It has to be tender. So what's a reasonable way of knowing concrete to be notorious for its variability as an engineer? I'm glad we have an outsider here, mechanical engineer. Okay? This is not like steel. Concrete is a troublesome material, but a beautiful material. How would you define it? He is the best person to answer. We've already been contaminated with whatever crude learning we had in our VTEC. He is an innocent outsider. Tell us. How would you? We want to, the designer says, I want to be sure. Yeah. Whoever be the contractor, whether the contractor is green, yellow, or orange, I prefer the center one, that is blue. You have no choice to prefer because you are doing the design. MES man is going to do the construction. Your okay. preference has no choice. What is the no call. You can't what insist on what, what? No, so you, in your design itself, you can insist on something. 
What will you say? Deviation. I will. I will. No, you can't do those things. The clue is, you can specify M30 concrete, M20 concrete. M so the definition itself you should capture. You want minimum 30 newton per millimeter square, 30 megapascal. How do you ensure? So that is including the standard deviation minus it should be. Ah, ah, tell me what the minimum uh, value should be. See, I'll put it this way. You have no choice who will get the contract. All three can get it. So they go by lowest tender. Also, he's being bragged by the orange guy, we might get the job. But even if he gets it, you want the building to be safe, yes or no? Yes. So, how will you specify? It's very important. Minimum strength. Ah, minimum strength. Beautiful. What is minimum? Yeah, this thing, you know, you heard of uh, normal distribution. What is minimum in a normal distribution? Minus infinity. <laughs> so, minimum is a difficult word to use. So, you, you understand? So, you have to make the minimum practical. A practical minimum. What will be practical? Actually, he's converging to it. What is the practical way? You know that you have to take some risk. Yes or no? This is a risk. There is a risk here. No question about it. How much risk you can take? Risk. How much percentage? No, when you said minimum, you know you could get a value lower than that. So you are willing to accept that risk. How much percentage of your Sample size can be below that. Five. Five! Congratulations! He is the original discoverer of characteristic strength. Okay, so that's it. That's how it works. Characteristic strength is defined as the strength of the material below which not more than 5% of the test results are expected to fall. Got it? We, we did it from first principle without going through the bad mugging uh, up that we went through. He did it from first bit. So it's also called five percentile strength. You know, when you have data dispersed, 50 percentile is the median. Five percentile strength is a characteristic strength. That means if you were to have a distribution, very rarely you get a perfect symmetric Gaussian distribution. But if you get a distribution like this, you are saying, Yes, this could stretch and you know, obviously this can't go below zero. You can't get a negative strength, so you, you, know, you have to, this is the lowest value you can get. But this is a risk you're taking, the shaded area. And so we say that this is the characteristic strength. So your mean strength should be much higher. But that's not your job. The designer doesn't specify mean strength. The designer specifies only characteristic strength. And the mean strength will be controlled by whoever supervises the construction, and he has to make sure whether the contractor is green, yellow, or red. Obviously, if it goes to the orange guy, the orange guy will have to have a higher mean strength compared to the other two. Right? So now you're getting the hang of it. So the mean strength is given. Uh, so, if you assume this to be a normal distribution, which is a big assumption, then by the properties of the areas of the normal distribution, you will find, find that this is 1.65 standard deviation away from FCK. So, if you were to design the mix, you should find out from your past history what's your standard deviation. Then 1.65 times the standard deviation plus FCK is your target mean strength. Or you could work backwards like this. Is it clear? So the area is 5 percent here, the rest is 95 percent. So that's the minimum. Got it? So now I have a complete because <coughs> concrete sets quickly. And then you remove the shuttering. Then it gains strength. And the rate of gain of strength depends on many things, especially the fineness of the cement. But we hope that after 20 days it more or less stabilizes. You have a standard, you see, so on the 20th day you test. After 20 days also you might get a little gain in strength, but we know that. 
Is it true? That's a trick game. Game strength. Okay. Now I have a question. What is coefficient of radiation? Who said coefficient of radiation? Oh, okay. We'll come back to you. I have now two contractors here. You and you. He produces concrete with a standard deviation of 3 megapascals. He produces concrete with a standard deviation of 5 megapascals. Who is the better contractor? Sure. Not necessary. <laughs> He's happy. <laughs> Not necessary. He's a low time, low budget, small contractor who's never cast concrete more than 20 megapascals in his lifetime. <laughs> With 20 megapascals, he's getting 3 megapascals as standard deviation. He is a big time contractor. He does only concrete which is M80 and above. Super tall buildings. And there he is able to get 5 megapascals. Now tell me who is a better contractor. Out of 80, only 5. Out of 23. If you give him that 80, he'll, he'll get a standard deviation of 12 or 14 or something. So you jumped into a conclusion just by looking at the raw numbers. You have to always link it to the mean. That's where coefficient of variation comes. Coefficient of variation links the standard deviation to the mean strength. It is actually the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean strength itself. Non-dimensional quantity which you can sometimes multiply by 100. So in general you could say if you can get a contractor who can give you less than 10% coefficient of variation, decent. Who's giving you 20% bad. Giving you 15% moderate. There are some very good contracts who can give you 8%. How do you get the hang of it? So, once you have a mean strength, you also know that this cannot stretch plus or minus 3 sigma. It will cover 99%, 99.7% of the sum. That's how the lowest value and the highest value you have some idea. Okay? Now, how do you decide the grade of concrete? Well, the code says it depends on exposure condition. So, if you could have five grades of exposure, you have mild exposure, this is IS-456. Mild exposure, moderate exposure, severe exposure, very severe exposure, extreme exposure. So, don't, so this is the first question you should ask. When you're designing, you should specify the grade. The grade is based on the durability aspect, how bad the exposure. Let's take mine. Mine is protected against weather or against weather conditions except if located in the coastal area. This is the lowest grade M20. In some countries it's M30, M35. I know in Canada it's M30. Sheltered from severe rain or freezing while wet, exposed to condensation and rain continuously under water, in contact with or buried under non-aggressive soil or groundwater, or sheltered from saturated soil, area and severe to Exposed to severe rain, alternate wetting and drying, or occasional freezing while wet or severe condensation are completely immersed in seawater or exposed to coastal environment. M30. This is what I would recommend for Chennai. We are on the coast. So the M30 is what we need. Sometimes some parts of the same structure you can specify a higher grade. For example, the external facade, the columns which are exposed and the interiors treat as moderate or mild. Very severe exposed to see water spray, corrosive fumes of severe freezing while sweat or in contact with a buried under aggressive some soil or groundwater in 35. And members in tidal zone. Tidal zone means you know, the, the worst thing that you can have is uh, alternate wetting and drying in saline. Remember the direct contact. So you'll find the worst damages take place when 
that you have uh, these jetties and piers, you know, they are constantly exposed. And you know, the salt spray is another load of stress. With time, all these increases as you increase more and more durability. So, in the earlier code, we had N15 as a minimum grade, now we have N20. This is for reinforced concrete. For pre concrete, strength also matters. So, M40 becomes a minimum. So, the design of a concrete makes for a specified grade involves economical selection of the relative proportion and type of cement, fine angle, forcing it water, and add mixels. You know, the mixed design is used to By itself, although compliance with respect to carriage strength is the main criteria for its acceptance, it is implicit that the concrete must also have the desired workability in the fresh state and impermeability and durability of the heart. So, these are the four properties which are most important. In the hardened state, you want strength, you want impermeability, and you want durability. Durability and impermeability and make. But usually you can do that by minimizing your water cement ratio, reducing your water content, but then it becomes a harsh mix, you can't mix it easily. So workability is what the contractor is worried about. Should be workable. You have to work on it. You have to uh, mix it well. You have to compact it. So this part, the hardened state, is what designers are obsessed about, and the green state, when it's still a fluid, hard thing, is what the, the contractor is working. So this is again something you can read up in the textbook. So I've been told to make time. Let's see what's the next topic. We'll just finish this. Uh, we'll start pieces talking later. We'll just wind up. So, right. So the other code that is worth looking at is IRC 112, Indian Roads Congress, which is a more recent code, which is actually uh, for bridges, and it's it's actually directly related to the Euro code. So here. We have the different types of concrete, ordinary concrete, standard concrete to M50, high performance concrete, M30 to M90, where the, this number is always strength in mega -punch. What is the difference between high strength concrete and high performance concrete? Good question. What's the difference? Both are high. What's the difference? High strength does not necessarily guarantee high performance. So in high performance, your emphasis on lifetime, on durability. So standard concrete is made on the base of design mix proportion by weight in addition to cement, aggregated water. It may contain chemical admixtures. That's to improve workability. You have accelerators, retarders, plasticizers, etc. To achieve certain target values of various properties in the fresh condition. Generally, concrete up to a 50 grade is good in this category. What about high performance concrete? High performance concrete is similar to this, but contains additional mineral admixtures. These are chemical admixtures, superplasticizers, etc., to make it workable. But this is to make it make the microstructure more compact to reduce the, the voids so that there's no ingress of water or chemical attack and so this is possible when you add special admixtures, fly ash, silica, fume, rice, husk, ash, etc. to increase strength, reduce porosity, etc. Concrete up to grade and 90s. Okay, so we'll stop here. We'll take up this just